Hi there. I'm John Michael Garropy, and this is Popcorn Roulette. Each episode, I ask a guest to come on the show. They suggest a movie. We both go watch it, and then we come back and we talk about it. Today with me, I have Ron Charette. Ron, what's something you do? Something I do. Uh, I sail. Excellent. What do you sail? Give me more information. Sailboats. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. You hit the nail on the head. That <laughs> and was I plunge exactly toilets. the information. I plunge toilets. And, what, what, is, uh, what is something else you could sail things. besides sailboats? Uh, just mostly sailboats, actually. <laughs> <laughs> they come in all sizes. There's different sails. You put Run. them up, you take them down, you put them up, you take them down. You ask me, uh, because I ask people to come on and we're going to end up having uh, some sort of theater food, and you're like, can we have some sort of low, no carb option? And that's almost impossible. <laughs> yeah. Notice I didn't say gluten free, because that yeah, would be ridiculous. That just ain't going to happen. No. Uh, like, uh, theaters just don't serve things unless they've got carbs in them. It's part of the plan. Well, um, it, well fat, what is it? Fat, sugar, and uh, salt. Yeah. All three of those things, if they're all together. Right. It makes people content on top of all that. They end up sitting down a little bit longer if they they got popcorn in them. In them. But we brought uh, with us some uh, nice uh, chicken wings from Sparky's. Uh, Sparky's in Haverhill. I've been told these are the best chicken wings in the area. Uh, buffalo wings, specifically. Yeah. Um, I'm sure. Well, yeah. I mean, Sparky's is I got, uh, up there. I got level, heat, uh, level three heat. Um, so this is the danger zone, but it's not the double danger zone. Not for me. <laughs> probably not. I figured you could probably handle three. I, before we actually talk about this, I want to thank uh, Chunky Cinema. I never got a chance to actually do it in the other videos because there's so much to talk about, and I keep forgetting to actually thank Chunky Cinema. They supplied the popcorn for us in, like, the first, the third, and the fourth episode. So thank you guys. Uh, it was really appreciated. And uh, uh, I'm quite sure we'll end up hitting up Chunky's again. But... We unfortunately only have the time for like one wing or so, but. Mm. Well, I didn't get the, you got the goopy, you know, saucy one. Like I just kind of got, I got to go a good amount of sauce here. I, I figured I'd go for just like a straight up buffalo sauce. I mean, if you're, if your store can't do straight buffalo right. wings. You know, first of all, Sparky's, get on the turkey leg option. He's <laughs> like, you want to have like a big hawking handful of meat. Yeah. You know, or just go for it. Er, 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 er. That's not bad. Mm. Very good. You do better in the second bite, too. That's very good. Well, so I didn't really appreciate wings until I went to North Carolina. And mm. no, they're not North Carolina wings that I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is there's these wings called Speedy Wings from Upper State New York that mm. my friends used to make all the time. And I'll tell you what, they're spicy, tangy, tasty. And, you know, you got to appreciate good wing. This is a good wing. Yeah. Today we're talking about The Fifth Element, directed by Luc Besson, starring uh, Bruce Willis, Mila Jovovich, Chris Tucker, and Gary Oldman. Ron, why you choose The Fifth Element? Because it is the most random movie I saw in my childhood. <laughs> like, it was the first movie I thought of, because it has pretty much everything you can possibly think of. It just, it takes all the time elements. Yes. It takes a lot of charisma, Low gears, high gears, like it just doesn't matter. I mean, science just, fiction it, combined with like an action movie, but right. like on top of all that, um, it throws elements of romance in there, and then just set design is is crazy in this movie. I just kind of figured, I mean, it, just, it just felt like they took a big blob of paint and threw it against the wall. Yeah, and just saw what stuck. So, for for our audience's sake, um, what's the plot of the Fifth Element? How does this movie play out? You have a greater uh, aspect like so, some, some higher, sort of higher power, evil. higher power, whatever, yeah. and and it's been put there before, and people are trying to discover it, and they're trying to work with it, and they're trying to move forward with it, but the, at the same time, the higher power is coming in to try to manipulate it, and to say that these things are important to us. Yeah, they don't really give you a specific reason why they're interested, you know, yeah. why they come back into the whole scene, but they set it all up, and then they just kind of come in randomly. Yeah. When they feel like it's necessary. Yeah. So, you know, it was kind of, I mean, right as you go into, the, I mean, it, it's kind of funny. It's like you could spend, you know, the the entire episode that we're talking about on the Just beginning of the, the movie. early scene in like yeah. 1912 Egypt. Or yeah. Something along it's those like, lines. And, it, and then it goes 300 years into the future, and that's where the setting is with Bruce Willis and everything. But, you know, the action movie starts way later, and the setup is with like Luke Perry. 
Right. <laughs> right, as if this is going to be a Luke Perry vehicle. That's that's the feel you get for this movie at the very beginning. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's and it's really kind of funny because you know they talk about four elements, but then there's three in the triangle. Yeah, and then it's like you know the, the, <laughs> the fifth go, element go. is in the middle. Please ignore the hieroglyphics. They don't well, represent what I'm trying what's going to, I guess what I'm trying to say is that you know like okay, so if you if you if you see. Um, you know, the teardowns from like, you know, there's, there's like on the internet, for instance, there's a bunch of teardowns. One of those teardowns, they, they literally like eviscerate the entire movie by going logically through everything. It isn't hard. <laughs> no, no, no. The funny thing is, is that they actually do miss a lot of things and they think that they hit it, but they missed it. Yeah. So while I agree with that sentiment, I also think that, you know, there's a lot to this story that they don't hold in their hand. And they kind of probably were just watching with some friends, just taking down notes. That's the problem with with that is is that like when you do a a tear down like this, and and uh, CinemaSins has been accused of this more recently that. Um, when you're tearing a movie down like this, you are oftentimes looking at it segment by segment and not taking on the movie as a whole, and you sometimes miss certain elements, or like one person caught one thing and another person caught another thing, and you compare notes, and all of a sudden uh, you end up with contradictory statements that end up in the same teardown. Perfect example. So um, we're, we're jumping around a lot, but sure. when, we're, when we're in the future, yeah. where uh, Mila just jumps in, this is a, I mean, it's not really a spoiler, but... Mila yeah. jumps if, into. If you're not expecting spoilers, you made a mistake when you clicked on this video. Yeah. <laughs> Mila, so just watch the video, watch all the internet stuff. If you right, like, right. If you're watch into, all if the you're understand scenes, the background and everything like that. There's a gala and event to watch. <laughs> there is. And, but then, you know, come back. And, and you know, so the, the taxi cab incident where Mila just, you know, she basically leaps off a tall building and just splat pancakes into, um, you know, Bruce Willis's cab. Yeah. You know, by the end of that scene, he's talking about a six-month overhaul. Yeah. The reality is, is that he talked about the six-month overhaul before he even, like, opened his apartment door. Right. But nobody, like, they didn't connect the dots in, in some of those, you know, criti criticisms. They were like, oh, well, just because the cab has a hole in it, it's a six-month overhaul. It's like, no, they don't need that. It's like, no, you don't understand. Like, that's, that's his, th the setup. It's, it's a shtick. It's a thing he yeah. says. Like, he's already a bad driver. Right. You know, he's already committed... Uh, ultimate amount of like you know driving sense, and and so to look at the, all of that and to say oh by the way you know, I mean like Basson does this he puts in little clues all over the place and the movie is full of plot holes granted There's no getting around and that. it's also but full like, of scientific the, inaccuracies and it's right, also right. full but, like, of the like the small things were like the, when the four cigarettes come down he picks one up and it looks like he's put uh, Bruce Willis puts a cigarette in his mouth backwards and it's not it's eighty percent filter and like the rest of it the actual cigarette I don't think you realize that. <laughs> That's the funny thing. I realized that the first time I saw it, I, thought I was like laughing my butt off because I was like, that's a, that's a really good joke. And then those same <laughs> cigarettes pop up later in the movie. They're just like smaller. and it, like So evidently people are regularly smoking these things. Yeah. Um, but let's take a step back because we're talking about how um, dynamic this movie is. Do you, have you taken a listen to the soundtrack? I mean, obviously yes. it's impossible to like not notice the soundtrack when you're watching this movie. So these are the musical elements that I was able to detect in the soundtrack. You have house, classic Arabian, Blue Man Group style percussion music, Stalinistic fanfare, slow jazz, Bollywood, classical music, hula, reggae, opera, and hip hop. Like, once we've blended this many types of and music, Peter Gabriel, like what what do we gain from putting this much music together? Because we've stopped making a melange of things that sound like have. Is there no overkill going on? Like, what's where's the topping off point? That's what I was trying to say before. It's yeah, like, it's literally a big paintball of of society and just throwing it at the wall. Yeah, because you know, as soon as Bruce Willis wakes up. You know, yeah. all of a sudden you have boom, ba -jung, ba -bow, right, ba right. It's like this weird, you know, like is a cat meowing in the background. Yeah, like it's, it's part like, of the soundtrack. It's, yeah. yeah, it's kind of like a jazzy, you know, jazzy Sounds like, setup. Sounds like a, a hip hop version of Seinfeld. And then all of a sudden, like you in. hear, like you know, you do hear opera elements, you know, and and you know, uh, Arabian elements in that, and everything like that. But the time period, what was it like, ninety four or something like? that? I think it's nineteen ninety seven. It's nineteen ninety seven. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that would make sense. So it's like it's it's when the two thousands started to really start to kachunk into, you know, some sort of a groove pattern. But we had like, just, you know, like that's we what happened in the 80s. Out of grunge. You know, like, you know, when, when, when uh, Back to the Future 2 came out, people were already thinking about the 80s. They were already yeah. kind of going towards it. Yeah. So when The Fifth Element came out, people were already thinking about the 90s. Yeah. And a lot of the stuff that happened in the 90s really kind of came from that, 
period, you know, 97, 99, you know, 99. Well, yeah, this movie specifically has a very stark contrast. Like, people like to compare this movie to Blade Runner specifically, not because they are stark. That's kind of funny. Because they're, they're so different from each other. Dune was actually, it's, it's often placed with Dune for, yeah. some, for some reason. Interesting. I, like, I, I assume part of it has to do with this time period and the type of director you end up working with. Um, and the special effects. Special like, effects. Yeah. Getting back to Blade Runner, like with the Blade Runner of LA versus the uh, New York City of uh, the Fifth Element, which speaks more to you, which actually feels more real to you? Well, LA definitely doesn't. Uh, yeah. Regardless of, you know, which, which LA it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my, my real basis for Blade Runner is actually the, the recent one. And oh, obviously, yeah. there was very little society in it. I mean, it was mostly, you know, them in the barren wastelands trying to figure things out and piece things together and push things forward. That Blade Runner specifically felt a little bit more like the original book it took its source material from. At least the setting did. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It was uh, as opposed to the, the wet and dark advertisements everywhere, the, the, the other Blade Runner. Yeah, like, yeah, so this fifth element was more like a, I would say, it actually included a lot of material like mm. there's a materialistic aspect to it where it's like you know they it was very judge dread in the sense or matrix in the sense that it was a it was a compound city there were a lot of things going on in it blade runner felt more like it was it had more to do with the the vibe yeah that we're getting from the city and obviously the rain didn't help right, right. <laughs> you know it's like you're limited to like basic you know the general area yeah of where you are where um, um like with Where you felt the grandioseness. Fifth Element, it is a set. It's a 100% set. It's a model. Like, it's crazy, like, the, the buildings, yeah, which they did. you they did don't that. actually think of it this way they when really you're watching the movie because it's they excellent still, model work. So, yeah, I mean, when they, in 97, even in 97, they actually built an entire city and they modeled the city and, um, and filmed through the city, you know, to get those shots. They like didn't a use, nine foot they high didn't use computer model. graphics. Yeah. You know, and, um, you know, I mean, so on the subject of their model work, like that, the uh, the ship that's being used, the Flotsam Paradise, is the largest ship that had been modeled right. up to that time, right. which is really funny because people like to point to it and say, look at the terrible CGI in the fifth element, and you're not looking it's at not. CGI. That is an actual ocean. That's an actual fl uh, model of, uh, of, a of a gigantic ship. Yeah, I agree. Um, which kind of almost points to the fact that they did too good a job. Like, <laughs> they made the ship look almost too perfect. I remember watching the, so this is another funny thing too, it's like you watch the HD version and it's, it's formatted for your screen these days, whereas like before it was formatted for your screen then, but it was pan and scan back then, it was smaller. Right. You know what I mean, you, right. you had more um, tight boxed things that you were looking at. So I remember watching The Fifth Element when I was a kid and I could see the model going up to the ship. You know, so like the the paradise. Right. I could see an actual flying ship going up to the paradise. I was sitting comfortably in my seat looking at an HD television. I couldn't see the model going up to the paradise because the paradise was this small yeah. on a screen that was this big. Right. Do you see what I'm saying? It's yeah, like, yeah. So, so, you know, it affords your grandioseness, but at the same time, it's like you lose, you know, details. Yeah. Um, and, and Fifth Element was definitely about that period where they had the, the, the opportunity, you know, to basically do whatever they wanted. You know, they could have gone CGI, they chose not to. Yeah. They chose to actually model, and they chose to, you know, to show everything they could, and they had the budget, and they I mean, had the star power, and they had all they these things. they didn't use plenty of CGI in the movie, but they were using models whenever they could get away with it. And that. explosions and yeah. everything like that. Um, there was actually uh, something, there was an explosion where three guys got enveloped in flame. I don't know if you remember that. It was when, um, right. uh, you know, like. It's in the airport scene. Yeah, like um, they were running away and they actually tried, the stuntmen tried to jump away from the explosion. They couldn't make it. They got pushed by the fire. Yeah. Uh, they are apparently are okay. Yeah, apparently are okay. From um, what I understand, but from I mean, what I, from what I, I heard, wouldn't, that, I wouldn't like that. That ended shooting in that studio because they pretty much burnt the place to a crisp in the process. Yeah, I wouldn't like that. So um, I mean, it's like you know, they still used a lot of real time effects and realistic effects in a in a period when they could have gone in other places. And the reality is, is that when, even when they did the um, the original, like the I'm sorry, the opening scene. Yeah. They they used it was it Morocco or something like that. They used that. You know all of those old artifacts. Interior was technically was. a set, but the exterior right. was all right. done on site in right. Morocco. Yeah, so like they, the setup, right? You know, it was on site. Yeah, and so you know, 
it's all those old school techniques. It's still all there. Yeah. And so to think about that, it's like, holy crap. I know, it's only been 20 years. We haven't lost anything except for the people that, you know, we will be losing if we actually don't use the, uh, the, the, the techniques of the past. Like the opera singer. Like the opera singer. Or those, or those big, uh, what was they, Mar- 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 Marrakeshian? But the, the, the big gold creatures, you know, they were live. They were yeah. six, four foot, you know, well, they, stand-ins yeah. that were sitting in these big, like hulking, like Almost 200 pound, right. 200 pound costumes, completely blind. Yeah. Like. Marching around and just trying not to step on each other yeah. to make the scenes work. Yeah, it was, it was like, that's, that, you know, they could have CGI'd that. The opera singer, they could have CGI'd her. They didn't. Yeah. You yeah. know? Well, I mean, like they would have had troubles back then, like making a perfect CGI of her, but they could have, they definitely could have done stuff along those, uh, something along those lines. Could have done something. Right. Her dreads or, yeah. or her, her skin color or something. I've got, uh, We'll, we'll break up uh, away from the special effects for a second here because uh, I always bring a negative review with me because it's rare I'm actually going to have an actual negative criticism of the movie. So this one actually comes from, so, so we get an alternate opinion from Mark L. Leeper, written on rec.arts.movies.reviews reviews. So this one comes straight from 1997, from the, from the old as tell tell from As you can tell from the, <laughs> from the address. I wonder if this is a postmodern science fiction movie. If so, I'm willing to go back to the modern and start over from there. The Fifth Element is a film that will probably have a cult following, while others will find it, as my wife put it, appallingly bad. Here, Bassan has made a film with perhaps the best art direction since Blade Runner and uses it to tell a dim-witted pop sci-fi story. Bassan, who also co-authored the screenplay, realized that a good plot might be hard to follow sometime. He simulates the same effect by having a bad plot that just has a lot of stupid things happening very, very fast. Now. I have issues with the uh, with his review, but I do wonder if, if there's something to that last part of it. Is did Bassan skip past the concept of having a deep, complex part and instead hit the MTV generation with like rapid fire scenes and like small details so that they didn't? Of course. Yeah. He skipped back past plot entirely. Yeah. Like plot is not the point of this movie. Yeah. Um, so what is the point of this movie? It's the visual effects. It's the I mean, it, what, we, what have we been talking about the entire time? Yeah. You know, Busan is like, you know, he's, he's only one person in the cock. Like, you know, uh, Jean-Paul Gaultier? Yeah, yeah. Did all the costumes. Yeah. Like, you know. Like, Ruby Rod looks crazy spectacular, and part of the reason why is because uh, Gaultier got him halfway there, gave him these ridiculous costumes to work with, and you can't res- not respond to that. You have to act like you're... you're mad and outgoing when you're wearing something like that because otherwise you will look completely weird uh, like a, a real creeper if you don't over do go over the top with a costume like that oh well yeah i mean he had to look uh, androgynous and you know there is there is a funny thing about that character um you know when you look at first of all you know look at the broader scope okay yeah i don't remember when friday came out but Chris Tucker and Debo Green. Yes, yes. You know what I mean? Debo is president. Right. That's a little foreshadowing, by the way. That was kind of cool. But like, you know, the idea is that, you know, it's like you see them both on, on, on that movie. Where have I seen this connection before? You know right, what I mean? Right. And at the same time, it's like, you know, Chris Tucker nails it. He really nails that he d- character. He does. I mean, like, reading through enough reviews, one of the biggest complaints was along the lines of, like, people didn't like Chris Tucker's character. Like, he could have gone like Jar Jar. He could have gone totally Jar Jar, yeah, yeah. and he didn't. He, he, they didn't like his character because he did it so well. Like, this was supposed to be an annoying, fast-moving character that, like, absorbed the entire movie into himself. Like, as soon as Ruby Rod appears, he's half of the rest of this movie just following him around. And I can understand the frustration with that if you didn't like the character. But... It's, it's hard to not get trapped by his energy. He does such an excellent job uh, personifying like the speed and movement of this movie. Um, well, he adds, he adds speed. Yeah. Um, at a time that it probably needs it. Yeah. Because when you're looking at, again, like the plot, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It really doesn't. I mean, they start off, they're talking about the artifacts and everything like that. They're very important, good versus evil and everything like that. I don't understand. Okay, so... Oh man, it's like we're bunny trailing now. Um, I, I don't, I didn't, I didn't mean to bunny trail, so I'll get back to it. But right. like, you know, you're going through all of these motions, you know, talking about the fifth element, mm. which it's a dubious claim to have, you know, 
you know, like let's say love as the fifth element. Right. But evil is not an element. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, it, it's, it's kind of like. The Planeteers did that. <laughs> I mean, like. Captain Planet. Captain I mean? Planet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but okay, so, so anyway, so, you know, you're going through that and, and people are trying to understand the plot. It's, it was very difficult to understand the actual plot. Yeah. You know, when you're going through movements. And the reality is, it's like, where are you going to go with that? How are you going to get to the end? Yeah. And it's like, you know, Chris Tucker brings that in. He brings yeah. that energy in and it's like, okay, now it's an action movie. Right. Now he's going to narrate the guns, the explosions, the, the running. He's going to narrate the, the push to yeah. get to the end, which is kind of like a Blade runner type thing. Yeah. You know, getting to the end. Right. And it's like, you know, they, then you're there. And then, you know, it, it's kind of anticlimactic again and it, I mean, it winds down very quickly. But it's like... You know, through that whole scenario, he carries, you know, the action scenes basically. Yeah. Um, as like a, as that narrator. I'm gonna side trail you again because um, I want to talk about this. Like, in this movie specifically, we see uh, a ton of women, but what we're actually seeing is uh, swampy, sex, uh, sexy stewardesses. Bussy McDonald's waitresses, fawning pop star groupies, eye candy secretaries, a nagging unseen mother, and a battle axe of an army major who's played up Tropes. as intentionally being. But, but like, w is this problematic? Like, Besson treats every woman in this movie, if you are not the perfect chosen one, as being oh. um, being there for the for male gratification in a sense. The setup was weird. Yeah. It was already weird from the start because he was looking at, you know, like the geneticist that came up and he said, oh, she has 20,000, uh, the genes that were used to replicate. It's like, he said it was like 40 of them. And I was like, well, you're close. <laughs> and I'm wondering how he actually, it was probably a guess. Right. But anyway, so the idea is that, well, now it's 20,000 that this perfect human has and everything like that. And he's trying to, you know, solidify that this is a perfect being. And he's trying to figure out ways to do that, you know, on screen. Mm -hmm. It's all a setup. Yeah. Like, it's, it's all candy. It's not really actual substance. And so, you know, and then the rest of it's tropes. I, I, think, I, I think that she actually, her setup is a trope, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, like, well... It, because it's, she's it's, supposed to be loved? It's rare we get a Jesus figure that's female, so I think Besson actually was on to something with that. But then, you know, uh, as a trope, he made her perfect, you know? Um, and I, I find it... Uh, I find it interesting. I just find it interesting comparing her to like every other female in, on, in the plot because there are a but, lot of women kicking but around, also perfect, but no strong woman. Perfect kind of was analogous to innocent, and I don't think that's necessary. Yeah. That's kind of how they put it. It was like, and, and you know, the monks and priests and everything like that, they were, you know, Catho you know Catholic. You know, yeah. Catholicism. They were part of Catholicism. It, like, or the like Catholicism it had that vibe idea. to it, you know. I mean, it so wasn't it was a like, clear you know, connection, but... Yeah, and it's like, that wasn't necessary. I mean, it's, it's kind of like, it's symbolism. Again, yeah. it's like, you, can, you don't have to take that and make it, you know, something that is, you know, the, the crux. You know what I mean? There are so many, like, again, aspects to this movie. I, I, you know, it's like to single out certain things and to say that, oh, well, you know, the nagging mother, you know, yeah. what was her purpose? It's like, right. it was a trope. Yeah. It was a throwaway. Yeah. Just like, you know, having the, the kid with the, the bowl haircut be the monk. Right. You know what I mean? That's a, that's a trope, too. As being somewhat uh, useless and an aside, and, and, like that part of his you know, weakness. And, and it says a lot about... I know, think the, part of it also is, is just like you're trying to set up... I mean, you know, you aren't, aren't only setting up uh, one female to be the perfect woman. You're also setting up Bruce Willis, in a sense, to be the perfect man. So every male beside him needs to be... Uh, like a weakling needs to be shrieking, needs to be falling over and fainting and well, stuff like he, that. He was the stereotypic hero. Uh, like action hero. He's, yeah. he's, he's, he comes right out of Die Hard and moves into this movie, not timeline-wise, but like that's supposed to be the feel. But the really odd thing about his particular character is that you see it in various places. He has over-exaggeration of his emotions. Yeah. Like he actually shows the face. And you, you have to wonder, you know, like why his expressions are that you know did Bassant actually say I want to see your face yeah I want to see you make these you know these remarks mm. or or was that part of Bruce Willis in his in his mind in his character um yeah I, it, I, it's just it it's just a weird movie there's so many different things going on in it yeah um and, we'll and that's have, that's why I thought it was so weird. We'll have to, to unfortunately end on that note um, because we're out of time at this point. But uh, it was great having you on, Ron. Do you have anything that you want to plug out of curiosity? Nothing. Nothing. Sailing. 
Sailing in general, people should get out there in boats if they can. Definitely. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. If you like the video, uh, subscribe, talk to us, comment. Uh, you know, we're pretty new, so you say something. We're going to listen to it. Um, it's been great having you on, Ron. Um, take care. All right. Bye-bye.